So now we come to our internet connection requirements. Now, as you'll see here on the um, on the screen, uh, I have listed out some points uh, that you should probably consider uh, when you want to run your Bitcoin node. Now, I would strongly recommend the use of an unlimited data plan. And the reason is, is because uh, running a Bitcoin node uses a fair bit of data and you just want that peace of mind um, that you're not breaching any data limits. There's going to be a initial blockchain download of 350 gigabytes at this point in time. And that is expected to grow about 50 gigabytes every year. So that is something that you will need to do on the first uh, initial um, blockchain download. And then subsequent to that, your node will communicate with other peers and upload data to them as well as uh, download data from them. And you are downloading the blockchain and serving it out to other peers as well. You can set your node to do certain things like stop uploading after a certain time or um, you know, there are things where you can sort of minimize the amount of data transfer, but expect uh, a fair few gigabytes, say maybe 10 to 15 gigs per month um, subsequent to the initial blockchain download. So that is something that you will need to uh, consider. In terms of speed requirements, um, it's best to check your speed tests um, to make sure that you have a low ping, um, and, and that's not necessary, but it just shows the health of your internet connection. You want something that is going to be reliable and uh, rock solid, um, and not too flaky either. Um, this will help you as you run your node, as well as as you connect through to it, um, uh, using your other services um, so that you are always connected online. Now, the speed requirements here in Australia, um, the base plan here is usually uh, 50 megs uh, Mbps download and 20 Mbps upload. I think that that is more than sufficient. Um, now, different countries will have different uh, speeds and so you just need to make sure that you are uh, having a relatively decent internet connection um, that is on 24-7. I used to have a uh, an internet connection that only had two Mbps up and that sort of worked fine, um, but it did choke out the connection. So you might want to have the, the better upload that you have, um, the better uh, experience that you'll also have, but also download as well because you will be downloading lots of data um, throughout this process. So this is something that you'll need to manage um, and make sure that you don't breach any data caps when it comes to um, your internet connection and your for, from your um, internet service provider. So those are some of the main sort of, I guess, internet connection requirements. You do need a decent internet connection. Um, so be on the search for that. Now, one of the up and coming services uh, that are coming out is the Starlink service. Um, now, I think that that is a satellite service that uh, is, is global um, and Look, judging by the uh, speed tests that I'm seeing online, uh, it's looking very promising to use that in you know rural areas where internet connections aren't so great. So I think that that's going to be a great global competitor um, when it comes to internet connections, and I think that that would probably uh, would potentially be a game changer when it comes to uh, running a Bitcoin node, so that uh, everyone will have access to good fast internet. Um, and that is being rolled out across you know 2020 and then 2021. Hopefully, um, we'll start to see more and more uh, places on the globe that you know you can order this satellite dish and hook straight into uh, the internet. So that can be a very, very uh, promising tool. So keep an eye out for that. Um, if you do have internet connections that are a little bit uh, shaky in your area, I think it'd be worthwhile going through uh, the internet um, and how it kind of delivers through and home networks um, and how that kind of works in your home and how devices get the internet. So in this diagram here, you'll see a bunch of computers that represents the internet. Now, off the street, you will get some form of cable. Um, this also could be a wireless signal. Uh, it just depends uh, on what your internet connection is. But generally speaking, you would have some sort of wiring coming into uh, your home and connected directly into a modem.
Now the modem will have uh, will be assigned by your uh, internet service provider an external IP address, and you can get that by just um, googling what is my IP, and you'll be able to find an IP address, and that will be. Um, something that looks similar to this and it will basically be something that you need to keep private um, because it is an identifying number to your household. It is also a number that is provided to you by your internet service provider. Now, the ways that you can protect that is using what's known as a VPN. Um, now, what a VPN does is essentially instead of uh, giving out this IP address, when you Google what is my IP, it actually broadcasts or gives or returns a returns another IP address that is shared amongst a, a, a number of uh, other users. And so what happens is that it becomes very difficult for the website that you are going to or any other place um, to def definitively pinpoint your uh, internet connection um, and, and your IP address. And therefore, it helps with your privacy. Um, now... Your modem will then be connected through to your router and the router's job is to route internet traffic through to your devices. Now, typically, um, you will have an input uh, or generally speaking, one input where the internet comes in from, from your modem. Um, some uh, routers are a modem router, so they might do both at once. The router's job is to uh, assign internal IP addresses um, and the into, uh, the IP address of the router itself is 192.168.1.1. Now that is the stock standard one. There's others out there. Uh, there is like 192.168.1.254. I've also seen 192.168.0.1. Um, it just depends on your router make and what they um, have assigned to be the default router uh, number. Now, uh, or, or the default router IP address. Now, the other thing that the router has is you can access this. If you are on the same network as your, as your router, you can access this through any device by typing into your browser 192.168.1.1 or whatever your router um, has assigned its default uh, router address as. Now, these routers, these general, you know, general consumer grade routers will have a default username and password. I would strongly suggest that you um, change the password such that anyone who has access to your network um, can't mess with the router settings. So that is something that I would strongly recommend. Log If you haven't um, looked into your router page, log in uh, using the default passwords or even the password that's provided on the router itself. There might be a password there that's a, a, that's a default one. So you might wanna log in on that and have a look through some of the settings and, and, and have a look at through um, the devices that are on there. Now, the router's job, as I mentioned, is to um, assign different IP addresses to different devices. Usually they have th uh, four ports for, for you to plug in your, your devices into, but then your router may also broadcast a Wi-Fi signal. So one of the devices could be your desktop and you've just Ethernet plugged that in. And your router will assign it an IP address of 192.168.1.2. The numbers generally go in, in sequence, or it's usually sequential, but it, can, it just depends on your router. Um, you might also have a, a, a laptop that is connected via Wi-Fi, and that might be um, given the IP address 192.168.1.4. You might also have a printer, a wired printer, and that might also be given an IP address of 192.168.1.3. And so um, you might also have a phone, which you then um, are connecting to your Wi-Fi, and you also w that will also have a an IP address of 192.168.1.5. Now, it's important with Wi-Fi signals to uh, create a strong Wi-Fi password. So just make sure that um, you log into the router page at 192.168.1.1 and you change that router password to something a little bit stronger. Uh, if it's not already, no one has access to your network is really what you want to try to protect. Now, in this particular instance, we are going to be running a Bitcoin node, and that could be a computer, that could be um, a virtual machine, so it might be hosted in here as well, and that might be given an IP address of 192.168.1.6. Now, all of these devices can access this particular machine, 
and you will be able to uh, look at the services or, or, or um, see the services uh, that is running on your laptop um, from the Bitcoin node. So you might type in 192.168.1.6 and then colon 3002 and that will bring you to BTC RPC Explorer, for example. Um, and so you can sort of see the services that go through. So you can sort of access the services uh, that this Bitcoin node is hosting on each of your devices. Now, when it comes to um, a little bit of uh, security and privacy, the node generally does not um, have private keys. However, with this build, we will have private keys. There will be private keys with uh, the Samurai Wallet stack, um, so Whirlpool. Uh, when we install Whirlpool, uh, that will have a private key, um, as well as the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network node will also have a private key. And so you will notice that the private key actually sits on this device. And from a security standpoint, um, it is now something that you should be looking to protect um, your network such that nobody else has access or no other devices have access to this particular node that you don't want access to. Now, some Wi-Fi uh, routers will have a, an optionality of giving guest networks. And what that means is that you can segregate um, certain devices out such that uh, they connect to the Wi-Fi but they connect in such a way that they can no longer access any of these IP addresses on your main network. And so you can segregate networks out such that the devices that you don't trust, say for example, you know, so your friends coming over, um, so you can segregate those devices out and have uh, your, your, your real network as devices that you control and you trust. So that is a uh, option that you may wish to explore as well. Now, when it comes to um, networks, um, it's probably worthwhile mentioning about remote access. Now, there's two ways that you can remote access into uh, the um, into your network. Um, now, the first way is through using a VPN. Um, and this is a VPN service. This is separate and distinct from trying to hide this IP address with a commercial grade um, VPN. That is called a VPN client. Now a VPN client is like you connecting through to, for example, ExpressVPN server or Mulvad server or ProtonVPN server. Those are your you know, commercial grade routers, uh, sorry, commercial grade VPNs that you can um, uh, use to protect this particular IP address, the external IP address that your internet service provider has provided you. A VPN server is something that you can either run potentially on your router or any other of your devices. And what that means is that you can then, for example, if you have your mobile phone and you're on 4G and you're out and about, what you can do is VPN into uh, your network and it will assign it an IP address um, such that it thinks that this just belongs as part of the network. And so you can then call on services from your Bitcoin node via the VPN. Now that is a VPN server and the phone in that instance would be the VPN client. Now you can host the server on the router, you can host it on this. Now it does get a little bit technical and so I have later on in the series explained a better way um, or an easier way to do this um, uh, if you're not so technically inclined. And so you use a service called Zero Tier. It's an open source free piece of software that you can install on all the devices that you want in a segregated network. And you can overlay uh, these IP addresses with the Zero Tier uh, IP addresses. And you can then access your Bitcoin node from uh, anywhere in the world. So that is really, really handy. The other methodology is through Tor. Tor is um, a little bit more private and it is a little bit uh, slower and less reliable, but it does get the job done. And so you can expose um, services through Tor. And in fact, that's what the Samurai Wallet stack does. Um, and so when I get, go through that, you'll be, uh, that, that will run through Tor. Your, your wallet will hook up to your, um, your, your dojo um, via Tor. 
And so um, you, you can start to access your laptop uh, from your laptop anywhere in the world uh, using the Tor browser and it will hook back into your Bitcoin node. And so you can do things like Spectre Desktop on that. Um, you can what, look at your uh, your BTC RPC Explorer, any other services that um, are available on your Bitcoin node, you can access it via Tor. My preferred method is VPNs. Is it because it's faster um, and it? I find it to be a little bit more reliable, but it is really up to you. It really just depends on your internet connection as well. So um, these are some of the, I guess, uh, notes that you probably want to consider um, when running a, a Bitcoin node is just making sure that you do have um, uh, your password, your Wi-Fi password uh, quite strong, as well as the password to your router uh, admin page that you want strong as well. And um, you want to make sure that you kind of you know, know what devices are coming into your network. So those are just some of the things that uh, you might want to be aware of as we, you know, build this node out. Um, it's just more of an FYI kind of thing as just a, a total approach rather than just going straight into it. We'll now go straight into it and install Ubuntu and all those sorts of things. So I will go through that in the next video. Thanks for watching and if you would like to support the work that I am doing, head on over to our website at ministryofnodes.com.au and click on the support button. We also have paid video tutorials so feel free to check out our store for that. On our web store you can find a booklet that contains the commands to the entire series so feel free to check that out as well. And finally, we also offer private consulting sessions where we can discuss Bitcoin related matters. Feel free to book in a session on our calendar. Once again, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.